Colonel A.D. Wintle, M.C. Colonel Wintle, has your career ever taken you to a desert island? Not exactly, if you perhaps exclude uh, Ireland. But uh, I've been in places which are not unlike a desert island. For instance, I was a prisoner of the Vichy French, where I was kept in solitary confinement without daylight for 13 months. So you know what solitude means? Oh, yes. Do you think you could face up to it again? Of course I could. Yes, I mean, after all, I'm never bored if I'm present. <laughs> Does music play a big part in your life? Very much. Do you play any, any instrument? I used to strum on the piano, and I still strum when uh, my wife isn't present, because she really is a musician. <laughs> Do you play the gramophone a lot? Nope, hate it. Oh, well, you, you, you're going to get one now to, to play. Well, I can take it, I suppose. And you've selected eight records. Let's hear the first. The first one is Cavalry Ravelli, played by mass trumpeters. A Ravelli, played by the mass cavalry trumpeters at the searchlight tattoo at the White City in 1957. Colonel Wintle, where were you born? Uh, I was born in Mariupol in South Russia, near the Crimea, on the but, Sea of Azov. But you're not a Russian parent. No, no, God forbid. I'm entirely English. And by English, I mean English, not British. Mm -hmm. When did you come to England for the first time? Um, when I was seven years old. You see, my father and mother were in Russia at the time. Then we went to Romania. I still remember playing trains in Romanian. Plekatreno, Petrobuzu, Ployeshti, Predial, Bukaresti, Vienna. Whoop! Until I was still not to wear my boots out. Yes. Then I went to France and remained there for a good many years. And during that period, when I was seven years old, I came over to England for the first time. Mm. Why did you decide to become a soldier? Was it in the family? Uh, my father was not a soldier. He would have liked to be. Which regiment did you join? Originally, I was a gunner. Then I went to the 18th Royal Hussars, and then I ended up in the Royal Dragoons. Mm. You went to the Royal Military Academy at Woolwich? I was. Mm -hmm. at the, uh, the shop, as they call it. Yes. And, in fact, my next record is one from the shop. And it is the second march past we had when we marched up and down the front parade at the shop. And this is a most stirring tune. And it has always stood me in good stead to hum it to myself in the most anxious and frightful moments of war. What's it called? It is called Light of Foot. Foot, played by the band of the Coal Steam Guards. While you were still a, a cadet at the Royal Military Academy, the First World War started. Yes, and you the were... Kaiser's Wars, I yeah. prefer to call it, yes. And you went to France? Yes. Although I believe you were, you were badly wounded in action, you, you went back into the line? Yes. Where did you serve after the armistice? I went to the war office, where I forget what I did. Fortunately, nobody noticed it, so it made no difference. Then to Ireland, during the years of trouble, and then to India, northwest frontier province of India. For a while, you were an instructor at the French Staff College in Paris. Yes, I was there for five years. You were brought up bilingually. You, your, your French is as good as your English. Yes, I read, write, and speak French, as I do English. And also German, too, except, of course, I haven't got the profound academic knowledge of German that I have of French or English. Hmm. Now, in 1939, war again, and, and you went back to France. Yes. And the following year, 1940... You were the centre of, of quite a bit of trouble. How did that come about? Well, it's a long story, but really what it amounted to was this, that uh, having seen my troops, my men, my soldiers and my friends decimated, blotted out by the incompetence of a lot of idiots in the Kaiser's War, I saw the same pack of idiots coming up the street again in Hitler's War. Mm. And so I thought it was about time to throw a spanner in the works and get them chucked out. Yes. You, you tried to <coughs> set off on a one-man mission to, to bring the French Air Force to England. Well, not exactly the French Air Force. I had no plan. I'd, um, during one of my travels to France, during the war, I met General Madigal, who was uh, Chief of Staff of the French Air Force, who was a great personal friend of mine. He told me the French wouldn't stand up to it and that we ought to prepare something to straighten things out if we could. He made me promise him that I would go and find him the day that occurred. I gave him my promise, but I also reported it. Yes, and uh, uh, as a result of uh, your attempts to carry out that promise, you finished up in, in the Tower of London. Tower of London. Very good address. <laughs> in a charming place, and um, 
But your court-martial acquitted you of the charges. Well, it acquitted me of uh, those charges. I mean, for instance, one of the charges that I said that certain of His Majesty's ministers ought to be shot was dropped when I started reading out the list of those whom I considered should be shot. <laughs> yeah. And so on, I was eventually convicted of committing a civil assault. Because I told some inconsiderable civil servant that he ought to be shot, and I very much regretted that I wasn't going to do so. <laughs> well, let's break off at this point and have your third record. My third record is from Magic Flute. Mo After your spell as a, a prisoner in the Tower, what, what were the conditions like in the Tower of London? Oh, quite delightful. Guardsman McKee, who was given to me as a first servant, used to bring me whiskey and ginger ale every morning sharp at 11. After that, friends would arrive with things like ducks in aspic and so on. <laughs> it sounds very pleasant. <clears throat> and, and when you came out of there, where were you posted? I was posted to um, Middle East. I went to General Wavell's GHQ in Cairo. Yes. And then you went into occupied France as a Frenchman? Yes. Well, the problem was we had to send uh, some fellow off who could pose as a Frenchman, with the Vichy French who were being chucked out of Syria. Yes. The only idiot I could find who was suitable, I thought, was myself. And this was to lead to a second spell of imprisonment, a rather grimmer one, the one you were talking about earlier. Yes, I was betrayed. I was invited by Dalnar to meet him. Of course, it turned out to be a vulgar trap. Mm. And um, I was incarcerated in Fort Sainte catherine at Toulon. Does Yes. Kept in solitary confinement without daylight for 13 months. There's a story told that you went on hunger strike there because of the bad turnout of your guards. Yes, well, you see, I had to do something. And uh, that was my way of fighting the enemy hmm. and to get these people to brighten their ideas up. How long did your hunger strike last? Uh, 13 days. And then at the end of the 13th day, they gave in and said that the guards would not only be clean but agreed to my inspecting them. Splendid. And then they gave you a meal. They Well, they offered me a meal, but I told them that I usually dined at 7 and not at 7.30, so they must start again tomorrow. You made several attempts to escape. Um, yes, three. Yes, and the last one was successful. Last, yes. You came back to London, and then what? Well, then, uh, I... Mind you, I came back weighing 7 stone 8. Mm. My normal weight's 11 7. I got that back, and then I went to Burma. Yes, and after the war... Well, just before the end of the war, I came back to London and was instrumental in recruiting the various commissions of control that were being formed for Germany, Austria, and Italy, and so on. Yes. And then you resigned your commission? Then I retired, yes. At which point I think we might break off for record number four. What's that going to be? Well, record number four has got nothing to do with soldiering or anything, but it's a beautiful little tune which I adore. It's called Schubert's Serenade, Stentchen. And that's what I'd like to have. Now, you left the army after, shortly after the last war. We haven't talked about your career as a writer yet. You had been writing while you were in the army. Yes. Well, um, I, it came about that I broke my leg in 1924. Mm. I did not fall off my horse as a dentist might. <laughs> a horse fell on top of me and broke my leg. Yes. And... I got bored with reading, so I thought that uh, I'd write a book. I wrote a book called The Emancipation of Ambrose. It was um, filmed, was translated into Spanish, into French by myself. In fact, did very well everywhere except in England. And that was the first of, of many books. That was the first of many books. Mostly fiction? Mostly, entirely fiction. I'm bored with fact. And mm. I mean, a report on military subjects bores me beyond endurance. Are you write sometimes under your own name and also under a nom de plume? No, in those days I wrote under a nom de plume because uh, for an officer, a cavalry officer, uh, to be literate, let alone to write, is rather a disgrace. <laughs> and I would not have liked it to be known that I was capable of such enormities. Now, your writing career in, in recent years was interrupted by a very long and, and, and complicated legal case. Yes. Yeah. You had... Yet another spell of imprisonment, this time for, for debagging a solicitor, I remember. But you conducted your own case all the way through to, to the House of Lords? Not all the way through. Uh, I was uh, so ill-advised as to be represented in the first case in the High Court, which was the lowest court in which I've ever been. 
Then, having seen the mess that the people who were representing me um, made of the thing, I decided to chuck the whole lot out and to deal with the situation myself. So I took it through the Court of Appeal, where I lost two to one on. Then I took it to the House of Lords, where I won unanimously. This, I believe, is quite unprecedented. Well, I don't know about uh, unprecedented for me, no doubt. But um, I'm told that there have been two or three cases since 1800-odd when a litigant in person has won his case. But I'm also told that no litigant has ever been known to win it unanimously. As you did. Yes. Whether it means that the House of Lords have improved since those days or not, I don't know. <laughs> now, what else brings the story up to date? Appearances on television, journalism. Are you on a book at the moment? Yes, I'm writing. I'm always writing. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm writing a book called Military Intelligence, which gives my views on that abstruse art. Well, let's have your fifth record now, Colonel Wintle. What's that going to be? Well, my fifth record is going to be Light Cavalry. And I like this tune because I'm very fond of horses. And I can see the horses' legs moving through this tune. So plays Light Cavalry Overture, played by the Philharmonia Orchestra, conducted by Herbert von Karajan, which brings us now to number six. What's that to be? Uh, Gunnar's Faust. Yes. No question of that. I love it. But, of course, it's too long for this program, probably too long for Desert Island, too. And so all I want from that, at this juncture, is that song which goes, Je t'appartiens, je t'adore, pour toi je veux mourir. And, uh, well, between us, I shouldn't mind if somebody said that to me. As to the familiar question, could you look after yourself on a desert island, I should think you could look after yourself anywhere. Oh, I think so, yes. I mean, after all, you take... I was able to look after myself all, all these courts when I was surrounded entirely by nothing but enemies in sight. <laughs> Lawyers, you see. <laughs> and so when I should be more or less alone, I should be able to relax a good deal and get on with uh, something useful. Yes. Could you build a craft? Oh, I should think so. If you did, could, would you try to get away? Um, I shouldn't get away. You would? I mean, I'd try to get away. I should get away yes. if I would, built a craft, yes. Possibly. Would navigation be a problem for you? No, I think I should aim for some rather lengthy coastline, like, should we say, that of the two Americas, which yeah. I'm fairly certain of hitting sooner or later. <laughs> well, I hope you hit it at a convenient point. Let's have record number seven. Well, record number seven is uh, Wiener Blut. It's a charming thing, and there again, it's rather long, so I've selected a little small piece out of it. Yes. And I want the magnificent one. For all the saints who from their labours rest. And listen. Uh, as a small boy, I used to think it was for all the saints who from their neighbours rest. <laughs> and I thought, well, anyway, <laughs> these fellows are going to have a good time. But then another reason why I have it is connected with my first thing, my first march, light of foot. It reminds me of all my friends who were killed in two wars, of whom I think every day, and I never go into a public place without looking at innumerable empty chairs and think so-and-so ought to be sitting there. And so I would have that hymn to remind me of them and to please me with its beautiful harmony. Sing by the Cloister Choir. Well, there are your eight records, Colonel. Wendell, I don't have to ask you which one you would choose because you've already told us it would be the overture to the magic flute. Oh, no question, yes. And you're allowed to take on the island as well as your records one luxury. One luxury? Well, I think I should have a jolly good dog whip. But you wouldn't have a dog. No, 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 a dog whip's all I want. And I should have that handy in case uh, one or two modern composers I know should offer to land on my island. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> or in case, shall we say, German troops should offer to come and train there. <laughs> or even worse, in case some of your previous victims should offer to land on my desert island with their own records. <laughs> All right, you shall have your dog whip. Thank you. And, and one book apart from the Bible and Shakespeare. <clears throat> oh. Well, I think I'd like a very large blank book so that I could write in it. You know, inexhaustible. Yes. 
better than even one page left on the day I was taken off.